How are y'all today? It's great to see so many smiling faces. Thank you for having me here. I really do appreciate it. I see a few familiar faces that have been to the Carnegie before, and we appreciate that. Um, thanks for meeting me outside the Carnegie. We couldn't have been able to do this in the Carnegie considering it's such a small historic building, um, but I really am very grateful to be here speaking with y'all today. So the Carnegie History Center was originally built in, it actually started in 1902 and opened in December of 1903. So the reason that the community of Bryan actually wanted to build the Carnegie was that if you know anything about Bryan, it was a saloon town through and through. Um, excess of 20 saloons at the time that the Carnegie's um, mission was thought of. And so spearheading that were the cultured ladies of the Municipal Improvement Club, which is now the Bryan Women's Club. And so they were very tired of all the shoot 'em up, shoot 'em out, and all the drunkenness in the saloons and, and all of that that was typical of a uh, railroad and cowboy Wild West town in Texas. And so the ladies of the Municipal Improvement Club wanted to make sure that Brian had a little bit more culture than what was going on at the time. Now, there were particular requirements. So Andrew Carnegie had started the grants in his neck of the woods up north. And so he had built a couple Carnegie libraries. And while he was a little hard fast and um, steel knuckled, if you will, in his uh, work time, in his retirement, he became very philanthropic. And so he wanted to give back to the community and to the country. And so um, there were particular requirements that he um, mandated for any group or city requesting a Carnegie grant for their library. And so one of those was a nice piece of land in the center of town. And then the other was the funds to continue it. Because if you build it and you don't have the funds to maintain it and to pay the staff, then it's, it's a bit of a wasted venture. And so that was um, one of the things that Andrew Carnegie and his philanthropic um, the adventure would, would have liked to see with the Carnegie Libraries. And so that was mandated for all the Carnegie Libraries throughout the states. And so in particular, for us and Brian, that was one thing that everybody kind of scrambled and it was almost an overnight thing of where to pick it, where to put it, and how are we gonna get the money? And so the city council voted very quickly to set an amount of money and set a place to where it was going to be. And they were just passionate about bringing culture to little Brian. And it wasn't really actually very little. I mean, in, in our thoughts, we are growing rapidly now in 2018. But in 1902, it was still the center of a lot of area. You have the Brazos Valley, and everybody knows there's like four or five surrounding counties that kind of come to Bryan. They come to town, right? They put their town clones on, and they come. That didn't. Um, that hasn't changed in you know 115 years. That that premise that Bryan was the center was because of the railroad and because of the commerce. And so the ladies of the municipal club wanted something that people would be drawn to besides commerce and salooning and all of the other extracurricular activities that people were a part of. And so culture and learning was something that everybody was getting more and more passionate about. And especially these ladies who were like, we've got to, we've got to better, you know, it, it just can't be an, an industrial town. We want to make a name for ourselves. And they really did because folks would put on their town clothes and they would come from miles around. I mean, long, long journeys. You know, we think we get in the car now and 10 miles is like, you know, very quickly if the students are out of town. But uh, <laughs> if the, you know, they would get on their wagons and they would get in their um, buggies and they would come to town and they would come to the Carnegie and it was just something wonderful that they could do besides work. And so the education and the learning was just very important to the ladies who started this adventure of getting a Carnegie. So 
The Carnegie actually opened, as I said, in December of 1903, and they put it about Caddy Corner, if you know where the subway is on Main Street, that actually used to be Road Saloon. So it was quite close to one of the saloons that the ladies of the Municipal Club were trying to uh, virtually get rid of, if you will. So um, the Road Saloon actually was torn down at a later date, and I'm sure the ladies were like, hey. So in its place was a um, I believe an attorney's office and originally now it's a subway but that subway used to be a very popular saloon and so at the time as you can see by the picture let's see if I can get a laser here oh yeah so one of the ladies was commenting over here saying it's in the middle of nowhere it was truly um, it was in a cow pasture there is one particular memory, a, a, an oral history that we have that talks about folks running their cattle across, you know, the backyard, if you will, of the Carnegie. So um, at, the, at the time, it was just a pasture. There was no paving. There was no sidewalk. It was just a big, beautiful building in the middle of nowhere. And um, so it was a very large thing. I mean, so it's about 3,000 square feet. And so to me, it's, it's home. I'm, I'm there, you know, eight to 10 hours a day. And so it's, it's very, it's kind of grown on me and it's not so large. But when you come and you stand outside of it and you look at these big, beautiful Corinthian columns and you're like, oh, and just imagine what it was back in 1903 when it was just very, um, very large and just bigger than a lot of the buildings at the time. It was the largest building for a little bit and then of course they started to build you know theaters and um, hotels and so it very quickly got dwarfed but for one small brief period of time it was one of the larger buildings in town and so the legacy of Andrew Carnegie was that when he was a little kid he had to stop working very early and so he probably had or stopped going to school excuse me to start working and support his family when he was like 12 or 13 and so he was lucky enough to have a very generous supervisor or boss, if you will, that let him come into his home and choose books off of his library shelves. And so this, this uh, very kind um, employer let Andrew Carnegie self-educate. And so as hard-knuckled as we know Andrew Carnegie to be in his, his working years, we find that he, he became very philanthropic in education predominantly in his retirement years. And so that was one of the reasons he wanted to do the libraries. He didn't want to do a steel, I mean, I'm sure they, they have plenty of steel museums for Andrew Carnegie, but one of his passions was education and self-education at that. He wanted to encourage people to teach themselves and um, you know, help themselves to move forward and to better educate themselves. And so, because that's what he did, and that was his experience as a child, and a library is the perfect picture of someone coming in, choosing what they want to learn about, and then learning for themselves. And so that's how Andrew Carnegie grew up as an adolescent, and so that's how he was hoping his legacy would be remembered in, those, in the Andrew Carnegie libraries that are here today, all over the state. So this is one of our original pictures. You can't really quite make out the aha factor in this photo. So we have these beautiful steel columns in the entryway when you come into the Carnegie. And when you look up, it's kind of, I mean, it's as beautiful as the ceiling, but when you look up, it's those beautiful pressed tin ceiling tiles. And there's nothing like stepping into the Carnegie downstairs and just taking it all in. There are um, everything from the 99 restoration has been redone to be as close as possible to the 1903 appearance. And so we have preserved just about everything. This, um, you know, the circulation desk is gone, but other than that, the floors are restored, the beams, everything including those wonderful ceiling tiles. They're my favorite. I find myself just looking, um, 
hopefully that never gets old as I um, progress through my career. It's just a wonderful building, and I can't encourage you enough. To, we really can't get that, that aha factor sitting here in a, in a beautiful new building. It's just a wonderful, um, you know, the creaking of the stairs and the floorboards. We kind of joke around when we hear a creak in the building that we have our own little ghost, but truly it's just the building settling after 115 years. So it was designed in the neoclassical. If you've ever been outside of the Carnegie, let's go back to the, so these columns here and just its general um, facade is the neoclassical Greek revival um, style. And so we had our very own AMC graduate from 1886, um, Gisik, Mr. Gisik. Gisiki. I, I looked this up and I tried to call, <laughs> forgive my pronunciation. Um, he was one of the architect students from the early College of Architecture and so he actually was in charge of our architecture and it's a, a lovely, well-built building. I, I can't say that I, I'm, I'm very blessed not to have to call maintenance a lot. Um, you know the occasional hard rainstorm, and it was really well done, really well done initially, and then really well done again in 1999 when they redid it. So, um, our architect was a very, very fine designer, very well done, and so the building actually cost a mere ten thousand dollars, and I haven't done the gosh, the inflation for this year, but it, it's quite, quite a venture. Um, $10,000 was a, a very large amount of money in 1903. I, I can't imagine what the inflation equalization is today. So um, just, it's such a lovely building. And I, I am very, very passionate about being there and very grateful to be there. So I really am encouraging you to please come visit. It's, it's not too far away. And like I said, if you want to wait till the students are out of town, you can fly right up Texas and have no problem. So the original mission was, like I said, it was self-education. And so we had many nooks in the Carnegie. There are wings on the side of the building. And so a lot of those were kind of to not necessarily shoo the children out of the way, but to have little nooks for the children to be able to pick out their own resources and books and, and self-educate. And so um, this is just one of our, our many, excuse me, our, our many uh, photographs from the 40s and on. We started really getting into um, making sure that we documented who was in the Carnegie, what they were reading. And so these tables here, we still have, uh, I think, four. We have our original table in the what I call the conference room um, area. And then we also have three or four of these wonderful tables here and the chairs. If you've been there for a meeting or a DAR or um, you know, con Daughters of the Confederacy, you've probably sat in these chairs. And so it's just a wonderful, wonderful, sturdy place to sit. You know, the furniture was much more well-made. And so the Carnegie existed as a library through 1969. And so a lot, of, a lot of things went on in the Carnegie. So downstairs, there are these broad, beautiful wood doors that could be closed over the weekend. So the library would close on the first floor. And then the second floor was actually used as a gathering space. And so that was one of the requirements for Andrew Carnegie for his libraries was that he would have a gathering space for the community. He wanted that to be available to churches, to groups. We still house a, a good handful of groups that still meet at the Carnegie. But initially, unfortunately, the Great War came and um, the Red Cross needed a, a place to wrap bandages, prepare packages, recruit nurses. And so the Carnegie upstairs it has a stage and um, the stairs that lead you up are still there. Wonderful, original um, carved pine, I believe. And that would lead you into the second floor where you could access those spaces during the weekend. 
so you didn't have to be there Monday through Friday, which were the normal hours of the Carnegie before 69, before the 69 closure. And so we had the Red Cross ladies. They were doing their bit for the war effort. And um, many churches started in the second floor of the Carnegie. And then also the um, extra things like children's programs and school gatherings and meetings, like I said, like the DAR and the Con Daughters of the Confederacy and things like that, those were places that they could meet. Um, one of the things that um, is a bit of our legacy is that the Hoods Brigade would have their reunion there. And they did have that up until, um, let's see, probably until the last gentleman passed away from their unit. And so, um, that's just one of the great many things that the original Carnegie did right up until 1969. And so it, it was a great part of the community. And so I'm gonna go ahead and kind of jump into our new mission at the Carnegie. Today, it opened again in 1909. So when it closed in 1969, it became city offices. And so it was kind of, I wouldn't say it was, treated badly, it was just treated differently. It wasn't treated as a historical um, resource, it was just treated as an office building. And so there are some pictures that I don't wanna share with y'all from the 60s and 70s where it kind of just got a little older, a little more frail and a little less taken care of. And so um, fast forward to 1999, the city felt and really realized that the Carnegie was a great resource. And so in 1999, it reopened as the Carnegie History Center. And it is a research facility for genealogy and local history. And that means the Brazos Valley and surrounding counties. Um, so when you walk in, if you've just now got the genealogy bug, we can help you that our first floor is local history and then our second floor is a genealogical research floor and we have a computer lab and print resources so i should have brought a few of those today with me but eating and drinking so <laughs> the perpetual protector of the things so we do have the resources to help you find census records so we have an Ancestry.com account, and it's a library account though, and that means that it's gonna surpass your at-home account. More importantly, it's free at the Carnegie. I can't stress enough that all of the things that we provide now at the Carnegie are absolutely free. You don't even have to have a library card. It's a wonderful thing. You can pop in, see us, start your genealogical research. It's like pulling threads on a sweater sometimes. You get stuck on one and then you can pull another and then you can head on and we can help you pull those threads with the many resources that we have. So we have um, you know, print resources. So we organize by people group and international groups. We have passenger lists from you know, New York City, Galveston, any of the ports in the US, but we also have passenger lists from, you know, say somebody went from Texas to England and they, for some reason, left Texas and wanted to rehome in England. And so we have passenger lists that would list, say, your family members. And then um, the other thing, uh, just a unique thing, I, I'm, I'm coming upon them all the time, I'm just so excited about them, are their passport recordings. They're, um, they're reprinted, of course, because some of them have just gone to the to a wayside, unfortunately, because they're too old. But we have a book that records passports that were issued in Texas to go to, say, you had to go through an Indian reservation, and maybe it wasn't safe, but you still had to have your papers. And it was really unique because now we can go state to state, no problem, we'll hop on the highway. We don't have to have any papers. They do like you to have a driver's license, but you didn't have to go through, <laughs> you didn't have to go through your county officials or your local officials to get this very long drawn out uh, permission to go 20 miles down the road. 
probably maybe because you had to go through an Indian reservation, it was very nerve-wracking for the government as well as the Indian reservation um, government at the time. But there are these wonderful books that just list Mr. and Mrs. Smith, um, and Mr. Smith got his first name, so Mr. John Smith and wife, plus 12 children and 13 slaves. And they're going to point A from point, or going from point A to point B on this date in this year. And it's really a fantastic picture of what you can find at the Carnegie. Now, um, we, we love to impart that genealogy bug onto you. I know that it can be daunting, but we have four lovely um, staff members that can help you and assist you in any way. And um, for the, that's an example of our print. Now our computer resources are the Ancestry Library Edition, which is, like I said, it's free and it's so much, it's much better than your home edition. And then we have newspapers.com, which is one of my favorites. It, it is a really expensive resource, but it is completely free to you. It can bring you a newspaper right onto your screen from 1654 out of, you know, uh, Edinburgh Parish records from Scotland. And if that one was saved and scanned, you know, but we have things with newspapers.com that date back to 1654. And so it's just a lovely resource. Now, more local, you can get into the Brian Eagle and say you're looking for your great, great aunt. And you say, okay, I need to find Aunt Sue Mae Smith. And you put her name into the, Brazos, uh, into the Brian Eagle and you can search and it'll pull up these articles. And of course, the, the newspaper was our Facebook at the time. Absolutely anything and everything that you were doing was listed in that newspaper. If you were well off enough to put an ad in the paper, you could find that your great, great, great aunt Sue May went to Galveston with her friend Betty and they wore blue taffeta dresses and they went to the Joneses for lunch and they had cucumber sandwiches and they sat on the lawn. And so it lists you right down to what they were wearing, what they ate, what day they went, how long they stayed. I was looking at a uh, a patron's, um, it was the Cahills, and so the Cahill family, Miss Marilyn was in looking for this one particular uh, automobile crash, and back in, you know, 49 or 59, I can't remember which decade it was, it would say Miss Sally May was in a head-on collision, and she lives at 1909 Eccles Street, and it would list where you were and where you were going and how you went, and so we don't have that, you know, it's a little bit of a privacy issue now, but right then we have all these wonderful resources to kind of share with you what your family was doing. Now, newspapers.com for me is a little bit of a comedy. On my father's side, we weren't so posh and well-to-do. It was more like the Altmans have been jailed again. <laughs> and so, um, yes, my mother's side was more posh and she was the one going to Galveston and you know participating in my mother's line. But my father's line was definitely more on the, you know, headline of crime recently. So those are an examples. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, 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 no. I have a um, wonderful grant that we get from the Edge family every year. I was able to get one of those great new fancy printers. Now we have a regular printer that will print like an eight and a half by 11, but if you want like the 11 by 17 paper that I have is nearly the same size as like a newspaper, right? And so I can print it out really nice and big for you. You can read every smudgy line that you want. And um, it often just is, it's nicer because you can get one of those portfolios that looks like you're displaying an actual newspaper. And we have a bit of that downstairs on display so you can kind of see what the newspapers were like in the early days of Brian. And so it's a wonderful, wonderful question. You can print those out. Um, we have a little drop box that you can drop your coins in. It's kind of a little thank you for the paper box. And uh, beyond that, it is um, something that we really like to provide. And anything that you're looking for, like these records here, this is a um, vital statistics for births. There was a, um, a gentleman that came in, didn't realize that he had a aunt or uncle that had passed away at birth and nobody talked about it. 
So that is a warning to you. If you come in and you start doing your genealogy, you might find something that nobody wanted to talk about. So not necessarily a skeleton. It might be something that just is maybe too painful for a, a mother and a father to share with their family that they may have lost a child early on in their um, marriage. And so you may find that you have a great, great uncle that you didn't know about that maybe he only lived for five months. I mean, given the conditions, medical and otherwise, it could be. Um, I had a lovely school group come in and they were teenagers and I was like, oh, they're not gonna really enjoy this. I, I hope they do, but let's be realistic. But these kids, they sat down at the Ancestry.com. We had the computers all ready for them. And this kid popped up out of his seat. He started hollering. And we don't shush in the library like some people. But he was so excited. He had the printout in his hand. He was sharing everybody. He's like, I found my grandma. Because apparently his, um, his grandmother that he knew had um, been the step-grandmother and his original grandma had died early in childbirth. And so the children that were there were his family, but he was so excited. And so it can be thrilling for young people just as much as it can be for those who really want to contribute to their legacy. So it is something that I, um, I find that all the generations can get involved with. So that's just a, a little short picture of what we we have the my of course I mentioned the census records but those go back to 1840 and so they go through 1940 currently with the National Archives releasing every 10 years because of privacy and such but you can get on ancestry sometimes and I can pull up my great grandfather's um, registration for the army and it'll list his serial numbers and address and all kinds of things um, so that is why you may not be able to get anything past, say, 1940, as far as the census records are concerned. I've found um, yearbook photos of my uncles and my grandparents and, um, you know, uh, those directories, the pulp directories, sometimes they're scanned in. It really is just kind of a, a, a fun puzzle to put together. You can really grab those resources with Ancestry.com. And then we also have a few other free resources that we can point you to, like familysearch.org, that you can do at home, but if you're in our building, you can access actual scanned documents. So you'd have to be in the building to access some of the scans, but at home you can do familysearch.org, which is free. You don't have to pay a subscription. Um, the $70 thing at home, don't bother, come see us. We'll help you out. So, the other part of what we do, and mainly what I do as a supervisor, is to go through our records. Now, we have over 200 archival records. That, to me, is an original document. So, one of my favorites is an 1858. It's an actual, it says legitimately on the back, it says, a receipt of sale for a young Negro girl. And this is dated 1858 and it's from the Walker Estate, and it gives me goosebumps every time I talk about it or I take it out, and it's on this beautiful blue ledger paper. Mr. Walker was a, a scrimper and a saver. A lot of his documents are torn out of something. Um, he carried stationery from London. At one point, he was in London, and he ripped sheets out of the stationery book that they would put in the hotel rooms. I haven't placed the hotel yet, but he has these bits and tears of pieces of paper, and you have this young girl's life on this piece of paper, and it states how old she is, how much she was bought and sold for, who it went, who she went to, and then at the end is this wonderful, and it's tragic at the time, but it says, we'll be a slave for life, and then you think back, you go, okay, so seven years later, she's, she's free. And so it's such a poignant document to have. And we have older documents and we have newer documents, but this is one of my favorite documents because it really showcases um, the commerce and the movement of money and people as, as product. And so it's really, it's just a very poignant um, uh, document for me. And it's just really lovely. The edges are frayed. The ink is browning rather than black like it was originally written. And so that's just an example of the archival collections we have. So we have 3D objects like Harvey Mitchell's, um, gosh, what is it? Surveying equipment. 
so his tripod like bit. And so we have 3D objects, but we also have those um, paper documents and photos. So um, one of the things I wanted to mention also was our oral histories. I see a lot of bright, shiny faces in here, and I know that you have stories that you have shared with family members maybe, but you haven't necessarily shared with Carnegie, and we would love to have them. You may think it is a very small part of, of Brian's history, but when we take all of those oral histories and we put them together, we can piece a lot of our history in the local area together. And so it's wonderful if you have just a, a um, a family story that you think isn't very important, I'm gonna tell you that you're absolutely wrong and it is very, very, very important for us to have that. If you don't feel like coming out and you wanna make an appointment with Anne, our old history tech, she can come out to you. Um, I believe she's been out to y'all a few times or y'all, it's still in the works. It's still in the works. So it's in the works to go do oral histories at Arbor Oaks and so Anne will get her equipment together and her technical bags and hoof it over to wherever you are. Um, one of the um, favorite ones that I've done recently was the Luge Chick, the Luge Chick. It's a family here in Bryan that's very local. They um, have memories of driving their cattle across 29th. And I'm thinking, four lanes of paved traffic, oh my gosh, cows, ah. He's like, no, Rachel, it was dirt and small and teeny and woods everywhere. I was like, oh, yes, there was nothing there. Question. That's what he oh, was. Yeah, lots of lots of growth. Oh, wonderful. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Anne does that. She has everybody has a different folder. Each family. Mm -hmm. Yes, by names. By names. And so it's possible if you, I can definitely grab my card off the table and you can email me and then I can forward your request to Anne if you're looking for oral histories. But if you're looking to donate one, we would absolutely love to have it. So, sure. We do have a, a good bit of uh, the minorities in Texas. And so we have African American, that is one thing that was excluded, if you will, like minority movements and life was excluded. But one of my things is to, to try and start digging. I've been working with Mr. Wayne over at the African American Museum, and he and I have got together and we're trying to meld our resources to really dig up those stories as well. Yes. Yes. We can try. Yes. Yeah. Sure. Sure. We do. We actually do. Like I said, we have some original documents from the time period, the antebellum time, and then more broadly, we have text resources, and then also ancestry.com, and more importantly, we can get you into um, how to and where to navigate with the Freedmen's Bureau under the National Archives. So there's lots of resources. Having been a, what I call an archival baby of National Archives, I've learned quite a bit of how to navigate the national level of the archives, but then the more local. Because I was interested in this book called Prince Among Slaves mm -hmm. by Terry Alford, and I wanted to find out a bit more about his uh, you know, his descendants from where yes. did they go? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Please come see me. So I can go ahead and skip to the next slide. So, um, yeah, no, and any questions, please keep them coming. And then, 
Okay, this is this is 19 circa, uh, excuse me, circa 1910, and. We have the very large, I would say it's an 11 by 16, 15, it's, it's quite big in the original. And so you can't tell from this angle, but this is a Saturday. Oh, sorry. Saturday. It's a Saturday, and if you come into the Carnegie and you look very closely at these faces, you'll be hard pressed to find a pale one in the bunch. And the reason for that being is that the minorities were not allowed to shop on the regular shopping days. And the shop owners and the shopkeepers would open on a particular day and they would cater to the minority um, population in the Brazos Valley. And so there's so many unique things, I got you. There's so many unique things going on with this photo. The other thing, all of these, wagons, but there are two spots of upward mobility and technology that will come in. So this right here, you can't see it, but it's one of those uh, Ma Bell posters, and it's on the sole telephone pole in town. <laughs> and that means you're up and coming if you've got a telephone that you can use or that your business has. And so this place, this corner was hopping, if you will, because so they could post, you know, send messages to, you know, Waxahachie and have the runner go to the, you know, 20 miles down the road and give the message that Ma had her baby. <laughs> and so the other bit of technology is the only Model T on the street. So Model T started off the line in 1908 and Lowell Bryan had one in its midst, and I was like, that was a cotton grower. That was a plantation cotton owner, because no way could anybody else afford a Model T in 1910, two years after they, like, cars became cars. And so the rest of everybody has a wagon and some mules and some horses, but this guy, he was well-to-do. He was the only car owner in that picture on that day, so. I got one here, and then I'll get you. Yes, ma'am. We do Brazos Valley. So if it's not A&M, I will tell you, since I have very small resources, and A&M has a lot more, so if I find that someone's donated something that is A&M related, like directly A&M related, I will send it over to Francesca at the archives on A&M's campus at Cushing Library. If it is a college station, resource, excuse me, and family, I would love to do as much as I can to preserve that as well. Um, one thing, I skipped that bit in my notes, I think. So if you have pictures, I don't necessarily want you to give them to me. Don't ever go run and tell some of my boss, I'm trying to get y'all to give me your stuff. I would love to have scans of those things. Um, I have one of my interns right now, she's going through photo after photo, and it's of a family, um, the Cox family in Bryan College Station, and it has um, actual names, which is, is fantastic because sometimes we have pictures and we are like, who are these people? They're in this family, but we don't know who exactly they are. So if you have family photos, documents um, that you would like to donate or share, we would be happy to scan them and give those treasures back to you. Um, I absolutely am not Bryan College Station you know, I'm not split. I want to keep all of the history. <laughs> and as much as I want to keep all of it, I have to be very um, choosy, if you will, just because of our space. But I definitely do not want to exclude College Station families in that. There was a lovely production that just came out that we actually um, put into our database. It was one of the, um, it was really well done. I'm so excited about it. It's a book listing all of the homes that were taken off of the campus and scattered about. And so I really, really love that. If you don't have a copy, come on by again and see me. I can get you. We have one on the shelf that we are keeping and it's barcoded, but we have several that we can give away. And they're just little booklets, but it's, it's a wonderful, fun little bit of history of College Station. And um, I definitely, on an 
irregular basis, not as much as I'd like to. On, a, on an irregular basis, I work with Sierra Lettisol and Francesca that are over at Cushing, and we try to put our heads together and do as much as we can for keeping those you know, resources alive. And it's not just Brian that I'm interested in, for sure. Yes, sir. I remember that on my granny's house. Man, I would, people ask me um, what I would do with a time machine. I would just be busy all the time. I would go back to experience every little bit. I just, even, even talking on party line, I remember my granny talking about it and my dad talking about it. Um, it, and the big thing was that they even had a phone because they were farmers, and that's not like a, a top of the rung income maker. So for them to have a, a party line even was a big deal. And I, I remember hearing on it. I didn't get to, I didn't get to party on the party line, but. <laughs> so um, back to some of our print resources we wouldn't necessarily be able to get a hold of because some of these genealogical books are exciting. Expensive. They can go like $200 worth, and I'm just like, um, this is meant to help people. It's not meant to, you know, bankrupt them. And so one of the great resources we have is WorldCat. Oh, next. Sorry about that. So one of our genealogical resources is if you find that you have a family member and he's mentioned in next book and it's written by, you know, Dr. Jones and she has published in 1982 and you come and you research or you email and call and say, hey, do you have this book? I'd be like, mm, no, I don't, but let me check WorldCat. I can get on and I can go from, you know, Tuscaloosa to California and I can search the interlibrary loan on WorldCat and I can find that book. And if that library will let me have it, they'll ship it to me, I'll hold it It'll take like two or three weeks, so it's not an overnight Amazon Prime type thing. It'll take a few weeks to get to us, and then we'll call you in and say, hey, your borrowed book is here, come look at it. And you can find that resource with your family in it. Once you're done, you can make as many copies, take as many pictures um, as you like, and then we'll close it, and we'll send it back to Tuscaloosa or California from whence it came. And then if you think, oh, you know, four months later, I missed a page. We'll call it back. We'll order it again. So any book that we don't have, there is a very good chance that we can get it for you. So please do not spend the money on one book for two pages of your family's history. That's just absurd, to be frank. We want to help you. So the other resource I was mentioning is a, is a free resource that you can do at home. It's not as good. There are these little icons that you can't really make out because it's a teeny tiny picture. But there are, there's a picture of a camera on the side here. And this is where I helped a gentleman find his. So what we were looking for was a marriage record. And he had this gap. He had about a 100 year gap, two or three generations. And he could not find the great great grandmother. She was nowhere to be found. And ergo, he couldn't find a great, great, great grandmother and great grandfather, or how many ever greats. Couldn't find these people. And so he had this missing gap. And so we were searching, and we actually, so when you're in Family Search at the Carnegie, you can get access to these scanned photos. And so, I'm sorry I'm taking so long, I'm so excited. Um, so in Family Search, you can uh, pull up these photos and scans of these resources. And so what we found, was that he had the line wrong. While he, he knew in Hispanic culture, he was a Hispanic gentleman, he knew that his line goes through his mother rather than his father. He just didn't think to check for you know, the, the line. And so we happened upon Family Search's scanned records and found a scanned Spanish document. It was out of a church parish, you know, the giant you know, resources that the churches have that sometimes often the governments don't have. And so we were able to find it and it was a scanned page of the marriage record and it listed the great, great, great grandmother that he was missing and her parents and his, 
and the siblings because the line went through the mother. And so it was very exciting to see that he had found that missing piece and it was because of family search. Now, the Mormons have a fantastic passion for genealogy and they do so much for the science of it. And so family search was where we found that obscure gap for him. And so we were able to fill in 100 years with one document because they listed the marriage of the great-great-grandmother and then the, her parents. And so he found those names that he was missing. So we can, maybe it's not 100% that we'll do that for you too, but we can definitely dig and try. And we're all very passionate about what we do at the Carnegie and want to make sure that you maybe can fill in that gap. So I, I was only two slides away, so I'm very proud. I can often get so chatty because I'm so passionate about it. I just, I, I really love what I do and that's such a blessing. Um, this is my shameless plug for volunteers. I have these lovely glaringly pink flyers for you to pick up if you're interested in spending your time at the Carnegie and helping. I have a um, lovely need always for volunteers Monday through Friday. Um, we are closed on Monday, but I'm always open to volunteers. Always. So these are my glaringly pink shameless plug for volunteers. And we would love to, to join you in preserving the history. And you know, if you're there already volunteering, you might as well do your genealogical research. So, and a big thank you to letting me speak and somewhat ramble on. Um, I just really appreciate your time and I'm and, and very excited to share the Carnegie with the community. Um, just a little uh, kudos for the Carnegie. We were contacted about a few weeks ago by big old New York City because of one of the collections that we have houses Mrs. Anna Ludmila G. She was a famous ballerina that moved here after her Aggie son perished in a uh, tragic accident. And she felt called to the community, but it happened to be that she was one of the very f most famous 1920s, 1930s ballerinas, and she donated our coll her collection to Little Bryan Public Library in 1973. And so big New York City professor who is world renowned, has written many countless books, has called Little Bitty Bryan, Little Bitty Carnegie Library, to borrow some of the scans that we have of Mrs. G's collection. So that's just a glimpse of what we can do on a huge level, but on a more personal level, we can help you with your genealogical research, or if you're just curious about Brian and as a whole, or Brazos Valley as a whole. Um, now, any more questions, comments, sharing time?